Technology Thursday's uh, training session. Um, we have a, a very large crowd this evening of Ms. Crystal from the Adair County Boys and Girls Club. Um, I know this probably isn't everyone's favorite subject, basic computer skills, but it's all something that um, a little refresher kind of helps us out a little bit and uh, also helps us uh, learn a few new things. Even though we, we all use technology every day, we can always use a refresher like this to kind of remind us of the things that we forget about that we actually do every day. Um, a few announcements before we get started. Um, we will have a community leadership training for us that will happen right here in this room, the OCO training room on October 25th. It's a new series for us, something that um, myself and Brad Wagnon have come up with, a new series that is directed just for our Cherokee organizations and our Cherokee communities. This one will actually be over how to, understanding how to work in a Cherokee community. We know that, that we do this work every day, but truly understanding the people, the history, and where we come from really will help you in your work whenever you work in the communities and, and work to change people's lives. So join us for that. We'll have a 10 a.m. session. We'll have a 6 p.m. session. Remember the 6 p.m. session is the one that is recorded and will be archived on the website on the YouTube channel. So join us for that. And then um, something that won't be filmed, but I encourage you all to come join me. Um, November 1st and 2nd. It's a Tuesday and Wednesday during the day. If you can break away, I will be doing a two-day session over nonprofit management. If you sit on a board of directors or if you're managing this nonprofit, these are all things that, that you need to cover. Mission, vision, how to do that strategic plan that you keep talking about doing and you never really get around to. We'll talk about all the things that it takes to manage a nonprofit organization behind closed doors. Everyone sees what goes on in public, but they really don't ever get to see what you actually do daily. And we're going to help you work through those issues. So come join us. It will be in the community room here, just behind the restaurant of the Cherokees. Um, registration, breakfast starts at 8 a.m. We'll start the session at 9. Lunch will be provided. And uh, we will break at 4 o'clock on each day. So please come join us for that session. We'll have in November, we'll also have a community, we'll have a cultural enrichment series that month. That is the second Tuesday and again we will have a uh, we'll have a history lunch and learn in November as well. That's, well. That will be your third Thursday during lunchtime right here in this room. So that being said, those, those are our announcements for tonight. So we're going to go ahead and get started with this. This is a good informational training for everybody. Um, if you weren't able to be here tonight that's perfectly fine, but uh, I encourage you to watch this video and uh, see what you're catching up with. All this information that we're coming with you tonight actually is from a organization that we have partnered with in the past. They've been at our conference. They've, they've taught us a few things themselves. They're called gcflearnfree.org. It is a tree, it's a free technology training website. I encourage you to check it out for everything from Google products, Adobe, um, your basic things like Windows and when those operation systems change and even how to use your iPhone. There's buttons on my iPhone, I don't even know what they do, but they have a training to teach you how to uh, use those. So that's what will be based our, our presentations off tonight. Before we really get started, um, I'll ask our, our one audience member right now, what is something that you would like to get out of this tonight, Crystal? You need to be refreshed. You need the basics. You need to go through it again. All right. Well, we will do that. Here's what we'll do tonight. This is, here's our agenda. We've already done that. We're going to talk about our learning goals for the time. Most of this other stuff is obsolete, doesn't go with this. Our learning goals. Um, we want to, we're just going to cover the basics. We're going to go through the things that we all kind of forget that we do on a daily basis or we get into something and say, hey, I don't remember how to do that. I think we all know how to turn the computer on, so we won't worry about that. Turning on a computer, um, you probably knows where the power button is. Everybody kind of knows what the keyboard and the mouse is. You know, whenever you want to click on something, double click on the left. If you need to see the additional screens that you have on your computer, if you want to see the additional options, save, print, those sort of things. Right click right there on your screen and it'll pop up for you. Like it says here, the right button will help you interact with the computer. With, with the computer. And to move the cursor around, you know, move, move that mouse around. 
Move that mouse around, that'll help you move across the screen. As you can see here in the illustration, they're clicking on my account or shopping cart. Um, even to log out, you see they're, they're tapping on that with the, with the left mouse there. You can do this from your laptop as well. Most of you guys know that little, that little pad on your, on your laptop. You can double click right there on the left hand side, works just as well. Whenever you go and you start to, um, when you use your keyboard, you type letters, you type numbers, they, those are the sort of things. If you get a screen that says login, click inside the box and then use your keyboard to type it out. A um, little tip, if you have trouble remembering your password or if you have 20 different accounts and try to keep 20 different passwords for all of those, try to keep little hints to yourself so you don't forget those and have to reset your password every time. Um, I'm gu major guilty of that. I do that a lot. I try about 20 different passwords before I actually get the right one in. So leave yourself little hints so you can remember. <laughs> Note when using a computer, the main screen you'll start from the desktop, of course, whenever your full screen comes up. It's like a main menu or a table of contents for you. You can see most of the things that you'll want to click on are called icons. Icons are these buttons here, like on this screen. Um, Musify, Media Chat, uh, a screenshot. These are documents that you've saved to your desktop. You made them, you've made a shortcut. You've made it easy to find them, and you just double click on them whenever you want to open that program. As it says here, a button is a command that, per that performs a specific function within an application. That's just saying you're just going to click on that and you're going to open that application. In this pic here, you see Pix Editor 4000. This is just an example. Um, menus are organized collections of commands and shortcuts. Click a menu to open something. Um, you know, you see a lot of the times on the bottom of your screen, you'll see the menu. If you wanted to get into the Microsoft menu on the very left corner, you'll see the, the Microsoft logo. If you want to get into the menu to see your programming, click that. It'll bring up all the different options for you as, as you do that. Okay. When you open an application or folder, it is displayed in its own window. A window is contained area like a picture within a picture. Within its own menus and buttons specific to that program, can rearrange multiple windows on the desktop, switch them between them, kind of move things around, make it where it's easier for, for you, and uh, make the things that uh, are more commonly used easier to get to for, for yourself, so you don't have to search for those. Okay. Just some additional resources that you can find on their website. Buttons and ports on computers, setting up a computer, mouse alternatives. There's lots of different options that the website offers. But we are going to move on to our next thing. Get to the bottom here and we'll we'll click on our next screen and keep on going. We're going to talk about now how to use your computer's built-in help. Um, that's all a button that a lot of us uh, I don't know if we're a little embarrassed to use or um, Sometimes I click on them and I still don't understand what they're trying to tell me, so sometimes I just avoid them altogether, but they really are there to help you. Okay. Um, everyone needs help sometimes. Luckily, when you want to help with a computer program, it's usually easy to find. Okay. Just in your top toolbar, you'll see the help button. You can click on that help button. Or if you see the search bar, maybe you don't necessarily see the help button right away. You can put help into that search bar and it'll bring up the help screen for you. This is just going to kind of tell us how to access our built-in help. Most programs have one of two ways to access built-in help. Okay. As you can see here at the top window, they're illustrating to you here, help. Okay, what do you need help with in this program? Here, they, you're looking in Adobe Photoshop at this one. Um, you hit that. 
Um, do you need to help get started? Key concepts. You need help support. You need uh, tutorials. Do you need uh, videos to show you how to do something? All this is built into a lot of your programming. So uh, if you need help, don't be afraid to ask the, commu the, the computer for help. He's not judging you. Help files can be organized in a variety of ways. They can be table of contents, um, fact, or searchable database. Um, a lot of the times uh, on email, such as Outlook and those sort of programs, if there's an email that you're searching for and you need to get to it quickly, there, that search engine there helps you find that email, correct? Same thing with, with help here. You can type in a certain thing. Um, for instance, here they have Excel. And they, when they need help with column width, so you see in the toolbar there, they put in column width. Then it brings up the dips or di different kind of options about the column width. Um, are you need to change the, change the column width and the row height? Um, do you need uh, this, the specifications and limits of that? Column function. There's lots of different things that will bring up for you. You need to scroll down until you find the one that fits the need that you have. Most of your search engines also have help and or um, help topics and different things. Uh, Firefox, Mo Mozilla, Google Chrome. So those are some of your more, uh, more famous uh, search engines these days and uh, browsing systems. Um, the day of Internet Explorer is kind of going past us. So keep in mind that whenever you're looking, there's, there's safer, there's, there's some different alternatives these days. I'm a big fan of Google Chrome myself. Um, Google says it best, one account for everything. I love it. I love the Google Docs, Google Forms, and those things. And the greatest thing about it is it is free. So you can do a lot of cool things with it. Here they're illustrating Firefox for everyone. Here's their help topics. These are just basic things that people ask a lot. Basic browsing, installing updates, how to sync your browsers. You know, um, a lot of things that if we're very unfamiliar with, it wouldn't hurt to click on these and see how it can help us uh, do things better. All right. How many of us make mistakes? I know I make plenty of them. How many of us blame them on the computer? I do mostly. You ever think it might be operator error? I, yeah, most of the time. So here's an easy way to kind of undo your mistakes. If you're unfamiliar with a lot of programming, most of the times you'll see a little curved button at the top or somewhere on your screen. That helps you undo your mistakes. If you do something, don't don't, don't be afraid to undo it. There's, there's a way to get out of it, as it's going to show you here. And most of your, um, most of your functioning uh, toolbars, your, your ribbons, as they like to be called, you can go into edit. And as you can see, the undo button, it's telling you to go back because you messed up. So you can hit that undo button, and that'll do away the last thing that you just did on your computer. It's not going to do away with the whole thing. If you've made a lot of mistakes, so you need to hit it multiple times, too to get rid of all those mistakes. As you can see here, most programs do have an undo button. The one that is here is in Google Docs. Um, a great program if you haven't used it before. A great alternative to purchasing uh, Microsoft programs. Another way that you can do that on a Mac, Control Z or, or, or you can do Control Z. That'll do an undo. Um, command Z on a Mac. If you have a Mac at home, that, that'll be the command for that. Uh, most programs um, undo function, keep track of not just your most recent change, but an entire series of the most recent changes. So if you've made five, six, seven commands and you messed up on the first one, just keep hitting undo those, that amount of times and it should take you back to where your original mistake was made. Um, just to note, many programs also have a redo function, which will undo your last undo. If you use undo, but then you realize you didn't want to undo that, the most recent change, hit the redo, which is just the button going the other direction, and that'll take you back to that last thing that you didn't mean to uh, undo. Okay. Any questions, Crystal, about any of this stuff? The next thing we're going to work on is understanding file extensions. Um, file extensions are basically types, types of uh, documents that have files on them. 
Um, a file extension is a three or four letter identifier found at the end of a file name or following a period. These extensions tell you about the characteristics of a file and how to use it. This lesson will go over some examples of these extensions as well as how to determine a particular file's extension. Here's some examples of a file extension. Um, a JPEG, um, which most of you guys know is, is for images, pictures. A Word document uses a, a, a dot .docs, which is DOCX. Um, an MP3 file is MP3. Most of us know what those are. Thank you, uh, iPods and iPads and iPhones. Um, Excel spreadsheets, usually a budget. So budget.xls for Excel. Those are all extensions that, that, that we can all use to, uh, to name our docs and to make them easy, easier to find our documents. Um, hidden file extensions. Some operating systems hide file extensions by default to reduce clutter. It is possible to show the file extensions if they're hidden. Click on the links below, as you can see here. You can also usually tell what file type it is. You can run your cursor over your, uh, over your image. A lot of the times they, they will appear if you name your files in such a manner. They will appear on your screen. If they do not or if they're long and you're not sure what's at the end of this or what kind of file that it is, with experience you'll be able just to look at a doc and be able to tell what it is. But if you have any trouble, you can run your cursor over that image slowly and it will pop up the full name. So don't, don't feel like just because you can't see it that it's not there. Um, that's a very easy way for us just to identify the different kind of uh, files that, that we may make. This is everyone's favorite one, right? Downloading and uploading. These are the ones that always jam up on us, freeze the computer up because we tried to download 75 pictures that somebody posted on Facebook that you just had to have. Or you're entering out that cell phone or the uh, camera from the last vacation from three years ago. It's got three years worth of uh, photographs on there. This is one that can give everyone trouble. So while exploring the internet, you've encountered terms downloading, uploading. Sometimes you begin, you accidentally click on something and and uh, a virus or something decides to uh, download itself. So we'll talk about how to defragment your hard drive a little bit later. But um, downloading and uploading. Downloading means receiving data from a file and putting on your computer. Uploading means sending a data or a file somewhere on the internet. Um, if you take online classes or those sort of things, you may need to upload a document to the file and save. Um, it can be anything like that, or you may need to upload a file to an email so you can send a, a picture or a document to someone else. That's, uh, these are all great things in technology that we've been able to learn over the years, and it's made life a lot easier if we just know how to do it. Okay, usually when you download a file, you will start the download by clicking a link to the file. Many of your tutorials that, that, that we'll be using here will have a practice document. Um, if you're following along with us online, go ahead and click on that document and you'll kind of see, see what we're talking about. If you click the link, your browser should prompt you to select two methods for downloading the file. You can open with all download file and load it immediately, or you can, or you can save file, will download it and save it to your hard drive. As you can see here, save file will automatically put it to your hard drive it will be in a section where where you've located it and it's easy for you to find or even or even move it to a folder that you've created to make it easier to find and kind of keep things organized on your desktop okay either way once you click OK the download begins your browser will indicate the progress and time remaining on the download um, don't don't get concerned when you see when something's downloading and it tells you 75 hours left and then it's finished in two minutes um, it's not always accurate so if it's taking a long time it may be a little bit more difficult some browsers don't always start this download process when you click the link on a file these cases you can right click the link then click save as link to select a selection to download the file <coughs> excuse me uploading 
this is sometimes uh, confusing a little bit whenever you do a upload. The site allows uploads. You'll have an upload utility to help perform the file transfer. Each site handles the process differently. With some common examples, many sites have an upload button that opens a dialog box, for example. Um, for example, um, Facebook has a camera icon that begins the upload process. Um, if you go to post anything on Facebook, you can hit the, the, the file upload, and once you click on the pictures that you want to upload, you'll see it spinning until it uploads for you. And then you should be able to see it before you can post it. Always make sure that it's there before you post anything. Again, as you can see, a dialog box will appear prompting you to select a file. Browse to the location where your file is located. It may be on your desktop under documents. If it's a picture, it may be saved under your photos or if it's a music file under your music files. Just be aware of where that file is. Again, if you have trouble finding it, you will see in your right hand corner a search bar. If you know exactly what it is titled or what, or what it may be, you can uh, hit type it into that search button and it should be able to bring that document up for you and make it a little bit easier for you to find. Some sites support a drag and drop interface. For example, when you're logged in the Dropbox, you can drag the files from a folder on your computer and drop them into the browser window. You can just move things around. It makes it a little bit easier. You could take a file and just move said file over. You've got a keyboard cat here. You want to move him into the cat photos. Click on him. Don't let up and just move him over. That'll make things a lot easier for you. Downloading and uploading isn't difficult. They've taken the mystery out of most of it. Um, and if you ever have any trouble, you can always go back and then come back and try to redo that if your computer has some issues. There's so many different types of things that we can do with technology these days. We can't do any of them without software. We have to have the software. Software could cost money. Some, are, some softwares are very expensive because they're very high tech and they're very, uh, very useful and in high demand. Today, there are so many softwares that, that are free to us on our uh, phones, our iPads, our tablets, um, whether we're Android or, or, or Apple users. It doesn't really matter. There's a lot of free things, whether they be games, um, Google Docs, um, just a lot of different social media sites to the access of our phone. There's a lot of things that we can use for free. Let's talk about free software for a minute because sometimes free software can get us in trouble. Um, there's some not so nice people out there in this world who like to do things like um, embed some viruses in front, of this, in front of some of this free software, make it look like the real deal and trick us all and then next thing you know we're having to take the old laptop in and have it uh, to the old uh, computer doctor and having it fixed. So let's talk about the, the free programming just for a minute, this little safety tip for everybody. Um, there are free programs available. If you're looking for software for specific tasks or, or try to find a free alternative, non-expensive way of doing something, you know, a lot of people, whenever you need to buy Microsoft Office, you know, there's a there's a good price tag on that, so some of us uh, are usually looking for, for a freer option. Here's a little key for you 501c3 nonprofits. There's a Microsoft Online. You can actually type, use your EIN number, and as long as you're online, you'll, you'll have access to Microsoft Office. Just a little free tip for you there, if you can check for those sort of things. Usually the best way to find free software for Windows is to do an internet search, or Google Chrome, however you prefer to go. Um, on Android, iOS devices, um, you, which the Play Store, and then you have the App Store with the uh, with the iPhones and the and the Apple products. It's all available. It's all out there. Um, when there's no free software to use, it's sometimes called software gratis or or freeware. Um, if you don't see that it's that it's there, you can search those things as well. Now, when we talk about safely searching for free software, 
first you need to identify your needs. And the tasks you're trying to accomplish, do you need a simple tool or something very powerful? Sometimes I know that um, some individuals think that they, they just want to do some basic accounting. Well, I need QuickBooks. Well, QuickBooks may be a little bit more than what you need. There, there might be another alternative. There may be a freer alternative out there that's a little bit simpler than what you actually need. Instead of spending the amount of money for um, an entire QuickBooks system, which could run you up to two, three hundred dollars for sort of depending on the type that you buy for software, there may be a freer um, program out there that may, may help you out. So be aware of what your actual need is. If it's an extensive need, you're managing three or four different accounts, you need spreadsheets, you need all these things to be taken care of automatically, then yes, QuickBooks is probably the way for you. If you're just keeping basic ledgers and things, um, you can find, uh, you can use Excel spreadsheets maybe that you already have access to or Google uh, Sheets or um, another free software out there that, that can really help you. Next is search for information on a program before downloading it. Determine if the publisher is reliable and well liked and if the program is safe and stable and has the features that you want. Make sure, do, do a little investigating before, before you download something and click on it. Um, that's what the internet is there for us. Um, people love to write blogs, people love to write reviews these days. They don't, they don't mind telling you what's on their mind about a subject. Uh, uh, look, look at that, if something's gone wrong or it's downloaded viruses, people won't be afraid to type that in. Do a little reviewing. Um, read the reviews um, on neutral third-party sites. A publisher may remove negative reviews from its own site. Keep that in mind. Um, if you don't have a negative one every now and again, you may realize that something's not right here. So uh, make, make sure that it's not on their page. Look at a third-party, consumer reports, those sort of things. You should be able to find some good information on the, on the program. Don't click misleading advertisements designed to look like download links or error messages. You know, that big thing, you have a virus, you have a virus. Well, you don't have a virus until you click on that button and now you do have a virus. So, be very cautious about the things that you're going to click on. Um, avoid malware, included installers. Um, if an installer has options for custom search bars or other programs unrelated, tell it not to install these. Um, We'll get to how to remove those type of things a little bit later in this training, but um, be very careful about that. You can download, please download directly from the developer's website rather than from a third party site. Be very, very leery of those. Make sure it's the, the main site. Um, third party file hosting sites include malware and those sort of viruses that slow your computer down and eventually can cause it to crash. And, uh, cost you a little bit more money so and if you don't have one please get some antivirus software on your computer those can save you some big things they'll tell you you know be a little leery too about those free ones because usually they they can download some other programs and kind of mess your computer up a little bit um, use 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 some good antivirus uh, programming some malware antivirus program that you probably need to pay a little bit for um, but it will save you in the long run. It's a great Im investment, so I, I say to do that. Scan for viruses. Get you get that program. Make sure that after you download that, that there's no viruses that have been downloaded through through that with your uh, antivirus software. Keep yourself safe. Here's a little example of what it could look like. Freeware, as you can guess, see. In the image above, the download button at the bottom left is the real download link, while the other two are misleading ads. Could you tell the difference? Just by looking at this? Most usually you can't. Um, if you notice the top one, there's no, real, um, there's no real advertisement for the real thing. It just says download, play now. See, there's no actual names to it. On the bottom here, you can see same thing, even though it says what type of operating system, it's really not telling you the name of the product. So be, be leery, make sure all the information is there. Keep in mind that these safety tips are good practices, whether you're downloading free software or paying for the software. 
There's nothing stopping a distributor from building malware with the program and still tar charging you for it. Um, in Fall Else Fails, if this is something that you really become concerned with, you can always actually purchase the, the same disk kind of software and download it yourself from a safe, uh, a safe com, uh, com consumer. So be, be, be a little bit aware about what all those different types of things are. Now let's talk about what kinds of free software there could be. Um, security and system optimization, a cleaner, something that cleans up old files off of your computer. Um, an antivirus software, Avast, uh, malware bytes, anti-malware software. Um, have you a good antivirus and anti-malware software on your computer? It's very handy. All right, productivity, Keynote, note-taking, organizational software. That's a great free one. Metapad, an advanced text editor if you want something that's free to help you uh, edit text for you. Um, Foxit Reader, a PDF viewer, that's a great, that's a great free one. Uh, Cute PDF, it's a PDF writer that works like a virtual printer. That's something that um, you normally would have to pay for from Adobe. And uh, we can look at media things. Um, Paint, which is a simple image editor. GIMP, a complex and powerful image editor. VLC Media Player, um, it's a multimedia thing, a lot of like Windows media and those sort of things. Sometimes if Windows Media won't play it, VCL will play it, or vice versa. So uh, not bad to have a backup there with that program. K-Lite Codec Pack Standard. It's a multimedia player package as well. It's another good one. And Dropbox. Dropbox is cloud storage. Um, it helps synchronize file and file hosting. It does. It breaks down large files where you can actually email them and transfer those to, to different people. A great thing to have if you need to transfer mass amounts of information. Okay, why is some software free? Um, it can be a multitude of things. Maybe companies make donations to, to a certain website to, to, to give this out to nonprofits or to different types of people. Um, advertisements, the developers paid by other companies to place advertisements in the software or in its website, which makes it free. Data mining, the software collects information about users and sells this to advertisers or marketing researchers. You know, they're always looking to, to find that next customer, so that, that may be a reason why it is free. Um, bundling other software. Other software distributors pay the developer to bundle other programs with its software. This often includes malware, so, so be aware of that. Um, In-app purchases, too, whenever we purchase apps on our, um, on our iPads and our uh, in our phones. Um, the base software is free, but users can pay fees to unlock additional features. Um, Angry Birds gets me every time. I get on that last level, I gotta have those more gems so I can finish this level, so they'll hit me for about $2.99, so it's not always free, no matter how much fun it is, guys. Premium products or subscriptions. Um, the software itself is free, but the developer sells more advanced versions of the program or other programs or light programs that kind of give you a, a light program, which means that they're not giving you all the features in this one. You can do the basic things with it, but in other terms, whenever you look to do other things that you may need to go ahead and purchase the full program if you really need to do that function. Um, Adobe is that way. Whenever you download Adobe Reader, there's certain basic things that you're allowed to do, but if you need to, um, edit documents and some of those things you need to pay a monthly fee to them to do so. So be, be aware of those things that, that that can be a reason that it is free. Okay. Um, not all software developers earn money from software. They may have full-time jobs or whatever the situation may be, but under the license that prohibits profit or software. So um, that's why they do participate in in some software communities on the internet. And this will just kind of tell you how some free programs make money. I'm not really going to uh, cover all that with you. It's really not relevant to what we're doing tonight, but in your programming there, there, there is some options for you. And um, for those of you at home, again, if you want to follow along with me, you can go to gcflearnfree.org, click on the um, computer basic skills and you can follow along. You'll see boxes and captions of each one of these. So 
if you need to follow along at home with this, we are right here. Um, something else that is a little bit, whenever we want to talk about software, I'll give you guys another hint of something that is very useful. There is an organization called TechSoup out there for you 501c3 nonprofits. They are also a nonprofit out of San Francisco. Their whole program is set up to help you um, afford software, uh, Microsoft Office, Adobe programming, um, Photoshop, Adobe programs that, that may, may be good for you, um, Illustrator, Photoshop, the things we need to make flyers and logos and do our daily business with. They, they can help you with that. Um, I believe the last time I was on there they had Office 2013 on there and the only way you can purchase is to start an account, put in your 501c3 with them, let them approve everything, then after that you can purchase software. The last time I was on there, Microsoft Office 2013 was only $44. A high discount off the $175 that was sitting on the shelf in Walmart or Best Buy or any of the other places. Um, only open to you nonprofits, so keep, keep your mind on all that. It will definitely help you guys out whenever you go to purchase software. We encourage at CCO, we encourage you guys to use these programs. Now I've mentioned it enough. The next thing we want to talk about is PDF files. What is a PDF file? It's one of my favorite things, um, PDF files, um, especially when you're creating your own work and your own works and you need to share that with someone. Um, it's a great way to keep people from stealing ideas, changing your work for and uh, making sure that the original idea is still there. Um, as you can see, Adobe PDF files are portable document format files. Okay, they are one of the most commonly used file types today. And you can actually convert your Microsoft, uh, whether it's Word, Excel, or whatever, you can transfer those into a PDF file. And uh, here in a little bit, we'll kinda, I'll kind of walk you guys through how to do that. Um, it's a printable form from the web, such as an IRS tax form. Um, there's a good chance that it'll be a PDF file because they don't want you changing any of the wording or anything like that that's in there. Why use a PDF file? That's a good question. Why do we even need to use this? Let's say you create a newsletter, like it says here, and it's a, uh, it's a, it's a docx file, um, which we talked about, just, just how we label a document. Um, it's, a, it's a default file for a Word document. You go in, you can do save as, save as that, that, that program. And once you do, when it brings up the box and you can click whether you want it in documents, do you want it in pictures, do you want it in um, another file. But as you notice at the bottom there of the file before you save it, there's a down arrow. You can click that and click save as a PDF file and it will change that document into a document that can't, that can't be changed. So that's pretty awesome whenever we go to send that to people. Opening PDF files. Um, opening and viewing a PDF file is pretty simple. Uh, most modern web browsers will open PDF files directly in your browser window. Most, most computers and things are set up. It's so common now that it's much easier to use. So if you have a newer computer, it, you won't have a problem with this. If you need to view a PDF file just once, usually it's easy to open it in the web browser. If you need to access the PDF layer, you may want to save a copy to your computer. You know, click Save As, save it to your desktop or into, a, uh, into your documents. That way you can go back and see it later if you don't have time to look at it now. As it says here, save PDF document. Um, very handy to, to keep around. Um, and if you're making a PDF file and you, you've actually bought into Adobe to have the full programming, you can set that to where people can type inside of it in certain areas. You can set word limits. There's so many different things you can do that. Last year we actually set our um, grant files in that manner to where you were on, we had word limits and sections so you could only type so far and then it would stop you but you could type into the document so um, be very creative we'll get into that stuff later on in the series later on in the year but I just want you to be aware of these type of documents and uh, that they can be very very handy for you if you don't have Adobe already there's Adobe Reader or Adobe Reader DC 
Um, if you don't have that already on your computer, this is a very safe program. I, I encourage you all to have this on your computer. It, it'll allow you access to view uh, Adobe PDFs. Um, it will allow you to save things as an Adobe PDF and be able to send those to folks. So there's some other, um, there's some other things that go along with Adobe PDF where you can get more creative with it, but you will need to pay for those sort of things. Um, it's a great investment if, if you do want to try to pay. That's usually a monthly fee, so you would need a credit card number and those sort of things. But um, it's a great tool. It's a great tool to have. This will bring us down to editing PDF files. We mentioned earlier PDFs are primarily meant for just reviewing, not for editing. However, there may be times when you encounter a PDF that allows you to enter certain information, name, address, fill in blanks. Um, you can just click on those and type in. A lot of the times they will set a certain word limit in there, or, or maybe none at all, but sometimes you may not be able to see it on the screen, but when you send it to that individual, they'll actually be able to read the entire thing when it prints out. But um, just because you don't see it right away doesn't mean it's not there. But you can set word limits to this, so it can make it very, very handy. Um, this feature is not supported in all web browsers. You may need to download the PDF before. Like I said, um, you need to download that possibly if it's something that somebody sent to you. Or to create this, you know, you need to buy into the, the higher version of the Adobe PDF uh, reader system. Creating PDF files. There are several ways to create PDF files, but the method we largely depend on device for using is uh, Windows 10, if that's what you have. Uh, go to your print dialog box, select PDF from the list of printers at the top. This allows you to create a PDF of anything you would normally be able to print, including documents, emails, and web pages. Okay? Um, a lot of the systems that people are using now, you can normally right-click something, and you'll be able to print, you'll be able to print that off. Um, just by going down to print, you can select your printer and print whatever's off. Same kind of with your print as a PDF. It'll change any document into a PDF before you print it. Okay. Um, a little side note for you here. If you're on a Mac, the print dialog box has a PDF menu that allows you to save file as a PDF for all you Mac users out there. Um, if your computer is Windows 8 or earlier, there's a few options. The simplest method is to use a software that, that supports a PDF export. Um, a lot of the times, that's why I do like to use uh, Google Chrome, because they have all those options on there for you. Another option may be to use a PDF converter, like a small PDF. It's a free app in your web browser that can convert various file types, Microsoft documents, or whatever, into a PDF format. Um, another small, uh, another uh, app that's great to have on your phone or your tablet or, or even on your, um, on your uh, PC or laptop. So I encourage you guys to use that. It makes work a whole lot easier. All right, these are our basics of PDF files. So we've made it through the first little round. We're going to take a little 10-minute break. We'll come back from that, and then we'll finish up with the rest of the training with just a few things. And uh, thank you. I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? We got a phone call. We're switching over our payroll to a different accountant. They told us this whole week.
Let me get back. Um, now let's talk about how to update your software. Um, a lot of times it can be uh, <laughs> very frustrating, especially if it does its own, your operating system does it on its own overnight and you're ready to hit the road whenever you first get back into the office. But these software updates are very important. Things are always changing. There's different reasons why this happens a lot of the times that it's because of um, viruses or malware or different uh, safety issues. But don't be afraid to do that. Um, Keeping your software up to date is crucial practice in internet safety. Most software updates automatically, uh, they do that by default as long as you've got that set up properly. That's something that whenever it asks you to do those routinely, go ahead and do that because they need to happen. Because um, more than likely you'll forget to do it and then your computer will get behind and begin to lag and then we get the dreaded blue screen. So please try to keep up to date on that. Knowing how to keep your software updated can improve the stability, improves the security, lets you know about new features, things that it can do. Things are always changing in the technology world. You can read more about um, internet uh, safety practices here. If you're, if you're following along online right there, if you need to go back to this, you can click here to learn more about that. We're not really going to cover that in, in here right now. All right. Updating your operating system. Um, we just talked about how important that is. If you have a Windows system, this will tell us right here exactly how to do that. Uh, first, open your control panel. Go into your little Microsoft box. It pops up usually right about on your right-hand side. Um, I'll illustrate right here just a little so you can see. Boom, control panel here. Very simple to do, just like it's showing you here. Go into that control panel and check for updates as it's showing us on the screen. Um, Click on how to check for updates. Like it says, it may take a moment for Windows to read to search for updates. Um, it's just like us, and we're trying to dig into a file too. We need a little bit of time to find it first. So, so be patient with it. Um, as you can see here, it will ask us if we want to install these updates. It'll download and then ask us if we want to download and, up and uh, install. So click yes on this, very important. Um, it may take a little while to install updates. Um, it's safe to kind of walk away from the computer for a while just by sitting there and staring at it. It's gonna, not going to make it go any quicker. Um, saying dirty words to it just makes it more angry. So just, just walk away from it. Go grab a snack. Go uh, maybe try to do something else for a little bit. Um, it will prompt you. Otherwise, you're up to date. It'll tell you whenever it's installed. Sometimes your computer may need to restart itself. So keep that in mind. Um, after the after it's updated, you need to do a restart. Start your computer back up and then it will uh, automatically install those things for you. For Mac folks, um, to update Macs, um, open the App Store, click the updates at the top. Um, they'll be at the top of your label. You can see on the screen here, updates. Very simple for you guys to find once you do that. Um, Apple has an excellent support page on how to check for updates. So uh, by clicking the link here, if you're following along at home, you'll be able to see more information about that. Um, same process, let, let it download. You may need to restart, but um, just please be patient with it. Go grab something to drink, something to eat, you know, watch a little bit of Sports Center maybe, and come back and you should be okay. For many apps, regular updates provide new features, stability, security patches, those sort of things. Things that they found that maybe they got a lot of feedback from somebody that they're happening or they realize there's a mistake there. It's usually ways for them to fix things and to make things better, just like we all do through evaluation process. It's the very same thing. Um, here's an example of a vast free antivirus. Um, there's an update page on, on the screen. You can see right here it says update. Um, you would go to virus definitions. If there's an update, go ahead and click the update. It'll update that version for you. Same thing on the program, update the version. So make sure that you do these. This is what keeps our computers healthy. Let's talk about Firefox. Some folks like to use Firefox. Um, I'm not one of those people, but some people do enjoy Firefox. Um, 
In the help menu screen also checks for updates. If you um, have used Firefox quite a bit as your browser, you can go into help um, and go down about Firefox, click on that and it'll take you to a screen to do some updates. So keep all of those in mind. Very important to make sure that we keep this software up to date. As you can see, some of this stuff is pretty basic, so we don't want to uh, do all that. How to customize your desktop background, go to your control panel, hit desktop background, pick whatever you want, or if you have a picture that you want to use, normally you can just go over that, right click, and uh, set as that but a desktop background. You've done that, it automatically does it for you. So we're not going to cover a lot of that. That's very simple. Here's one that we all need help with what to do if your computer gets a virus and uh, most people can raise their hand on this one right now that their computer has received a virus I do it all the time I click on stuff that looked intriguing or looked like it was going to be an awesome free app and I didn't do due diligence and made a mistake and then I pay for it and and uh, these are ways to keep your uh, computer from doing that um, computer viruses can be dangerous and should be taken seriously. Um, people can get your personal information through these. They can um, really just mess with your computer. They can steal information off of your computer with these. So be very careful. Um, go through the basic steps of virus scanning and removal. But keep in mind that you still may be necessary to hire a technical sports uh, professional to completely remove the virus or repair your computer. Um, a lot of the programming will have a 1-800 number or um, can automatically have some different things. That's why the antivirus and the malware virus uh, protection is so important here. Make sure you have that on, on to help you. Sometimes they can take care of it and get rid of most things. Some things you may still need to go in and do manually. Then if you still can't figure it out, take it to somebody who actually knows what they're doing because they'll be able to figure it out very, very quickly. Um, Again, antivirus programs, we talked about the different kinds. Um, Bitdefender, Norton, Kaspersky, those are all great ones. Um, very good. And then, of course, like we talked about before, malware, the different types of malware. Um, there's lots of free ones that you guys can do. But to get the full effect, I would suggest you purchase a good antivirus program. You can run a system scan, run a full system scan. Once you verify that your antivirus program is running, begin a scan. Okay, let it run its course. And if you run a full scan, it may take a while. So again, walk away from the computer. Watching it's not going to make it go any faster. Yelling at it's not going to make it go any faster. Um, in my case, usually it makes it go slower. So keep that in mind whenever you're doing those sort of things. Um, just please, patience is a virtue whenever it comes to technology these days. Um, we always wonder how did we ever do without it before, but that's how we did without it. We just did without it. It makes life a lot easier. Just be patient with it. Think about the way that we would have had it done it the old way. <clears throat> Run a full uh, virus scan. If no viruses or malware are fine, if you still experience problem with your computer, try other shooting, uh, troubleshooting techniques or have your computer assessed by a support professional again. Um, if you continue to have problems of slowdowns and and uh, different things. Please, please get that checked out by a professional if those things continue. Review discovered threats and recommendation actions. Um, during the course of the scan, it, it's complete. The, the antivirus program discovered threats, recommended various courses of action. Usually, um, what you want to do here, if you're unable to remove any threat, don't ignore it, okay? Just don't pretend like it's not there, okay? Um, it's kind of like that mole going on your arm, you know, make sure that you uh, get it taken care of even though it doesn't hurt or anything like that. It could be something worse. Um, again, your computer will have a lot of support and help on it. Um, also, it should give you numbers to 1-800 numbers for support as well. Um, usually most towns have a, a center or a, a store in town where you can take it to and they can help you out. Um, Fortunately for us here at Cherokee Nation, we have a great IT and IS program. Um, we have problems with it's called the help desk, and they're there to help us out. So, 
Not everybody can have that, but find you a professional that is very good at what they do and they can help us out. Malware. We t I've talked about malware a lot. We've talked about it more than once tonight. Um, malware is an antivirus program um, that can have a malware program. You may want to install one if you don't have one that's not a part of yours. Um, they, they, they can do slightly different things. They look for different things, but they work similarly, so you can follow the same steps as, as we just talked about. Malware can be the same way. Run a full scan. It'll help find those things and try to eliminate them. Again, if you cannot take care of it through that program or yourself, then I would suggest you call a professional. Last resort, if all else fails, you're unable to remove the virus or the operating system is damaged beyond repair, I meaning it's to either erase the hard drive and reinstall your operating system and programs. At this point, you may seriously need to call the professional. I can't say that enough. If you perform a full reformat of your hard drive during this process, it is almost guaranteed to, re to eliminate even the most uh, the most persistent viruses um, but keep this in mind all your data will be lost so if this is going to happen make sure that this stuff is backed up somewhere else because you can't afford to lose it once you have to reformat it it is gone um, that's why it's crucial to keep regular backups of your data um, you can do that through file systems you can do that through um, burning them um, thumb drives, all different ways. Make sure your stuff's backed up if you ever have to reformat. Um, after refor reformatting a hard drive, um, you can perform a virus scan on the restored data and make sure it's not infected with the virus afterwards. That is a last resort. That's the last thing you want to do. So call your professional first and that's the thing that they said, okay, I'm out of options. You've got to reformat then. That's your only option. Back up everything and then do your reformat to save your computer. This sick guy, he doesn't look very happy, does he? Okay, moving on. That's what we do if we get how to set up a printer. You don't really need that. Connect that thing, put the disk that comes in it, download the program, and you should be good to go. Next, let's talk about how to disable applications from running startup. Okay, you may not realize it. But your computer runs several applications as soon as it starts. It does a lot of things. If you have, inter if you have uh, Outlook to pull up your emails or um, some programming maybe that you left up or everything that um, will keep your computer running smoothly. Um, too many applications can slow down your computer. It may take you five to ten minutes if you've got too many things pulling up whenever you start your computer. Make sure you close those things out if they don't need to be open. Same thing on your iPhones, your iPads, your Androids. Make sure that you go in and you close out the applications because if you don't, they will continue to run and slow. They're using up uh, hard drive space. They're using up a lot of your, your, your um, storage. So make sure that you close them out because it will make your computer run slower. Okay. Consider this before disabling anything. Before you disable an application from starting, um, think about this, whether you should or not. Um, Maybe it's something, maybe you move, in, move those applications that you're not using all the time into a, a different folder or something like that. Um, the, most of your Microsoft uh, Windows systems will um, try to do that for you. Do you, want to, do you want to consolidate? Do you want to move these? Do you want to eliminate this program that you've only used once in the last two years? Um, it may just be eating up space, so that may be something that you consider later. Okay. Okay, disable in a program's own settings if you want to disable. Um, some programs have built-in settings to enable or disable them from running on startup. Um, each program is different, so uh, look at your configuration menu. Okay, many programs have a startup setting, but some OS's may, may not. OS is an operating system, um, and they, they may automatically manage which programs run on startup. So you need to take a look here. You can see the screenshot here. This is of Dropbox. You can kind of see general 
these are just different things, you know, show desktop notifications, it's telling us to start Dropbox on system startup. So you can kind of manage that. If you don't want Dropbox to start up on system startup, unclick that box, get rid of it. That way it doesn't start up and automatically run. Um, things like that that you may not use all the time can, uh, can really slow things down for you. Um, for those of you who have Windows 8 or 10, um, just depending on uh, where, where you are now, um, those are probably the most uh, two common ones. Some of you still may be running on Windows 7. If you are, I really suggest that you upgrade. Um, it will be a, a culture shock for you if you do, but you need to really update that with the times. Um, in Windows 8 or 10, you can uh, go to your task manager. It has a startup tab um, to help you manage these applications. On most Windows computers, you can access the task manager by a simple control shift and escape. Control shift and escape all at once, okay? That, that'll get you a little shortcut to doing that. Then click this, your startup tab. As you can see, the startup tab that's located here. Um, you can select any program in the list and you can hit the disable button. If you don't want to run or start up, just hit the disable button. This will stop it from starting up whenever your computer starts up. Um, here's Windows 7. Like I say, that would be the last one I would suggest that you have if you don't have 8 or 10. Um, anything else, it's time to really upgrade and it's time to upgrade if you have 7. Um, Windows 7 and earlier, the process is a little bit more complicated. It's not quite as user friendly as 8 and 10 is. Um, you can do that by opening the uh, start menu and locate the search box as it says here. Um, if you're using XP, click run on the right side of the start menu. Um, XP is really not even serviceable anymore, so if you do um, go, to, go to the store and get you a new operating system and a new computer because you are outdated. In either the search box or the run dialog, type mis misconfiguration and press enter, which is MS config. Okay. Step three, as you bring the box back up here, as you can see this, in the system configuration window, click the startup tab again. As you can see here, startup tab. It got us to the system. It just took us a little bit longer to find it. Okay. In here, it will indicate run on startup. If you want it to run on startup item, then keep it clicked. If you don't want it to start up, then you need to unclick that. Again, we're just doing this to try to save your memory because this is what slows everything down if you have too much stuff running. Um, just a little side note, unlike Task Manager and newer versions of Windows, the system configuration utility and older Windows versions can include essential Windows processes. Um, be sure you know what you're disabling if it's something that's very important. You don't want to disable that. Um, and then again, if you're not quite sure if it's important, you need to contact your, um, your uh, a tech professional. Okay. Um, we will cover this too, how to disable in, um, in a Mac. Um, click the Apple icon on the top left. Uh, select System Preferences, just as it says here in the screenshot. In, once you get into system preferences though, um, open users and groups. You can see it here. Users and groups should be the first one to the left on your, on your ribbon. In the users and groups window, click the login items tab. Once you click the login items tab, it'll bring up those programs. Um, Once you did this, click the button to add an application to the list if you want it to run or start up. If it's already clicked and you don't want it to run, unclick that so it doesn't run each time. Okay. That takes us through our uh, that takes us through how the disable applications. Let's do the most important thing. This will be for you folks who haven't purchased one in a while. Maybe you still have Windows XP. Maybe you have something even older than that. I hope not. I hope, I hope you don't. But this, is, this next section is going to be for you guys. This is how to keep an older computer running slow, uh, smoothly. I know that these are expensive things to buy. Um, as they get older, we, we need to really make sure those software updates are made. We have to make sure that um, the antivirus and the malware is really running smoothly on here because um, with new technology and new 
new operating systems that can really put a strain on our older systems. Um, so if you, if you have the financial means to stay up to date on these, please do so. But this next section will keep, tell you how to try to keep it running smoothly if you're unable to do that. Um, sometimes just being stuck with an old computer can be a challenge for us, right? Um, hardware on older computers starts to face some limitations. You're not able to do some of the functions that you need to do, or someone sends you a file that is made in a newer, um, a newer system, which makes it a little bit more difficult to pull up on yours. Um, older versions of Windows, like XP, they no longer receive security updates. So that's a big bummer. That means that you're just kind of wide open. Um, they it's become kind of obsolete. They've moved on 7, 8, and 10. So you need to make sure that you are, uh, uh, that you're taking care of this yourself. You're really going to have to monitor this thing manually. Um, if you want to learn more about how to protect your computer from internet threats, you can click on the link here where it says protecting your computer from internet threats. I suggest you do that if you do have an older computer. Um, instead of using Internet Explorer, you may want to limit um, some of your internet threats that have a, uh, that have a little bit more safety on them for, as a browser, such as Google Chrome and Firefox, um, Mozilla, those, those type of things will help protect against some of those things if you're surfing the web. Um, if you're using Outlook, you may want to consider switching to another email client like Thunderbird. Um, a lot of internet threats um, are become very vulnerable in Outlook, so you might be, you need to take those extra precautions whenever you have an older PC. Um, the next thing you can do is consider upgrading your operating system. One option is keeping your computer running smoothly and securely is to get a newer OS. And by new OS, that's an operating system like Windows 8, 10. Um, it can give you current security updates, help you with support. You have a little bit more option of trying to keep everything running smoothly. Um, they will cost you money, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, and again, for you 501c3 folks, hit up techsoup.org. They can try to help you with uh, purchase this stuff at a little bit of a discounted rate as long as you're a 501c3 nonprofit. But before upgrading, consider if it's worth these costs. Um, you know, sometimes a new operating system might cost you as much as, as a newer laptop may. Um, or at least half the price. So you may look because if you buy that, it's already got it on. Then you, then you also have a new computer and you get rid of this whole issue of having an old computer. So think about those things, okay? Um, alternatively, you can install a lighter free operating system like Linux. Um, it takes some time to try to learn that, but um, it has many advantages. Usually it runs well on older computers, but. Um, if you absolutely just can't purchase one, that's another option is to look into using a, a different free operating system like Linux Resources. And if you want to learn more about Linux Resources, there's a link right there attached. Let's talk about what it takes to maintain your computer. A lot of the times whenever you need to maintain your computer, make sure you shut it down. Shut down your computer at least a few times a week or every day. Um, I'm one of the worst about just leaving it on or just logging off of it before I go. Make sure you shut it down so it can rest. Don't, don't let it run. It, it's not allowed to drink coffee, so um, it has a hard time keeping going. Um, clean it up every once in a while. Uninstall programs you no longer use. This not only goes for your computer, this goes for your iPhones, your iPads, your, uh, your Androids, your, your Galaxy, Samsung phones. Um, uninstall programs you no longer use, you know. Um, I'm the king of downloading games on my phone and then playing them for about a month and then just never taking them off and I never touch them again. Get rid of those things. Free up that space. Um, don't, don't let things that you're not using eat up that space. And delete large files you no longer need, especially media files, movies, music, images. Um, there's different things you can put those on if you need to save them, thumb drives. Um, um, external hard drives, different things like that that you don't really need on your computer all the time. There's a way to save those for, for later use if you want to use them. But delete those large things if you don't need them. Disable programs from running on startup like we just talked about. Disable those things that you don't need running as 
the computer starts up. Um, disable those for us, that way they're not spinning and making com your computer run slower. And then again, use a maintenance tool like CCLEAN or antivirus, my, my, malware programs, make sure that everything's as clean and running as efficiently as possible. Just throw it all in the trash, and if it's old computer, time to buy a new one, I'm just saying. Again, back up your files. Again, older computers are more likely to experience hardware failure. And we just talked about having to reformat your computer um, if, if all that happens. So back up your files. You may have so much stuff on here, you're going to get the blue screen of death eventually. Um, make sure that you're prepared for the blue screen of death if you have an older computer or even a newer computer. That can happen so quickly. Uh, make sure you're prepared. You may have some very important information, some very important work or documents. Um, pictures of your kids that on there that you could never never get back if if it's not backed up properly so make sure you do the backing up of your files okay especially if you ever have to reformat defragmenting we're going to talk about now how to defragment our hard drive. We're almost to the end, guys. We're on the home stretch here. We're going to talk about how to defragment that hard drive. Um, as a computer owner or, or a user, there are several steps you want to take whenever it's not running up to speed. Um, one is de defragmenting or defragging your hard drive. Um, we'll show you the basics of defragging here. Um, this lesson will focus on Windows. Um, if you have a Mac, you won't need to defrag your hard drive, okay? This is just for you Windows users. First of all, what is defragging? Um, defragging um, is, uh, is a way to, to kind of get rid of things. Imagine all the information you had in your hard drive is a load of laundry. There are lots of different types of clothing and colors, and they all get mixed together in the wash. All your clothes are still there, but they're jumbled together and take a lot of space. This is similar to what happens to time to our data on our hard drives. We just keep adding to it, we keep adding to it, we keep doing those sort of things. Everything gets moved and separated or fragmented and your computer has to work harder to, f to find everything it needs, okay? Um, once you're finished, when you defrag the hard drive, your computer is doing something similar. It takes all the data, reorganizing it, so the computer can find things more easily and make the most of its available space. Why should we defrag? Why should we de de defrag? Defragging your computer can both solve, prevent a number of problems. Okay. If you don't, um, it could cause your computer to run slower, longer times to start up. Um, your computer may even freeze up or not start up at all and then you're really in a mess especially if you haven't backed those files up again that's that's a point whenever I have to call the IT guys and say hey uh, something's not going right here how do you defrag your hard drive um, if you have Windows 7 or newer okay your computer automatically defrags your hard drive on a weekly basis if you've if you've got the uh, if you got the schedule up properly. Um, but here we'll just kind of show us how that happens. In the start menu, menu uh, search bar, type defragment in. You can see how how it's going to happen here, and then click the defragment and optimize drivers. You can see it right here on your screen. And um, this is this is what you need to click. You see in the bottom here, they typed in the defragment. And here's where it popped up. That's what you need to click is what's highlighted there. The optimized drives menu will, will appear at the bottom. It shows where the schedule defrag. The change settings button on the right, as you can see there, will, uh, will bring that up for you um, if you need to change anything. Look at it. Make sure that it says that it's on uh, frequency weekly. You know, if you need to change that, please hit the change settings and go in. And if you need to do it more often or less often, I, I wouldn't do it less than a week. I would do it more often, actually. Um, if you find that your hard drive is not being defragged automatically, you can also manually defrag it. Select the drive you want to defrag it, then click the optimize button. 
Um, the process of defragging can take a long time, so maybe you want to let it run overnight or during a time when you don't need to use your computer. Okay. Um, again, walk away from it, go watch a movie, hang out with the family, just stay away from it for a while. Again, staring at it, yelling at it, it's not going to make it go any quicker. These, this is something that's very important for us as, as, as we move on from this here, is that we, we, especially in older computers and just on daily business, we do so much with our technology and so much with our computers these days that we have to make sure that we're uh, taking care of the computer, just like we take care of ourselves. Um, just as when we get hungry, we, we eat, right? Well, when a computer starts running slow, we need to take care of it too. We need to defragment, check antivirus, and do the general things um, on startup. Make sure things aren't running that don't need to be. Do the little things, that's gonna help do it. Um, you can also find some good cleanup programs that are free that you can download, and it'll help get rid of those cookies and those extra files, those extra internet files that just from uh, searching the web that don't need to be there anymore. All right, we've hit the home stretch. We're on the last two things. Um, we will talk about installing software on your PC and on a Mac, and then we will finish with uninstalling. These will be our last uh, four little sections here. They're not very long, as you can see. Your computer allows you to do some really amazing stuff. Uh, you can do digital photo editing. You can play video games. You can... Uh, um, Facebook. Everyone loves Facebook. I mean, you can do so much with them these days. Um, video chat with loved ones if you're far away. They allow us to do so much, especially with, with internet. So, developers are always creating new software and applications. They're getting rid of old viruses. They're making things safer if someone has, has attacked it with a malware or, or, or a virus. So uh, they, they do these things to, to protect us and to make the software better. You know, a lot of the times the games that we like to play, you know, they'll change things, you know, and, and make the game better. So always stay up on that. So we need to make sure that we're doing the right thing. To install from a CD-ROM, um, this doesn't need much explanation. If you've got a CD drive on your computer here, you can stick that in there, put it in, It'll ask you if you want to install, you hit yes, and it takes care of the process for you. It may take a little bit, may require a restart of your computer, but that's, a sim that's the simplest way to do it. You know whenever you're installing from CD-ROM that you're not going to run into any issues unless you bought it on the, uh, from a third party that was selling it on the side of the street. Then you might have a problem. But normally, purchase from the store, CD-ROMs are the safest way to install your software. You can also install software from the web. Um, that's the most common way these days is just to download it. Again, be very careful about where this is coming from. Make sure that this is the mainstream company that is offering it. It's not a third party knockoff that who's just trying to steal information from your, from your uh, computer. So be very careful there. Um, this kind of shows you just what to do. You want to get a fast free web browser. You can see download Chrome. Click on the button there. You can locate the double click or the exe file. Um, this will download into your folders. Okay, normally it'll ask you to save. You can hit save and then run, and then it will run the application for you. Okay, as you can see here, the dialog box will appear that it's installing. You see the bar. Um, sometimes they'll have a timer on those and kind of give you an idea of how long it will take. Again, if it takes a while, walk away. Um, the software will be installed. You can see the application from the start menu. It will automatically come up for you from a start menu once it's on there. Um, as you can see here, this one has a lot of Google, has Google Chrome, Google Drive, a lot of iCloud things, Java. Um, Adobe would be one that, that would pop up here for you if you had Adobe. So uh, you can see most things from the start screen. A few tips for finding software. Um, the easiest way to find is search the web, of course. Um, if you're looking for a way to edit some personal photos on your computer, you can uh, run a Google search for free photo editing software. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're not exactly sure what you're looking for, um, try typing in tasks that you want to complete or something like uh, you, you're looking for a free calendar organizer software or, or whatever you may be looking for. 
Um, type those things in, see what comes up. And like I said before, do your due diligence, find out if this is a good project, program, look at reviews, make sure that no one's reporting any uh, issues or anti any viruses or anything like that um, along with that software. So do, you, do your due diligence. And the internet is a great way to find them. There's a lot of things out there that I don't know exist until I look for them. So I do encourage you to do that, but I also caution you to, to do the due diligence. Um, through Windows, they have the Windows Store, which is uh, programs that, that they help support. It can be games, it can be uh, different types of programs, charts, music, collections of movies. It can be anything like that. So that's also another safe option for you to download things is through Windows. Okay. That's an easy way to install things. Um, Let's go back and we will cover this for our Mac folks, for you folks that have Macs. Okay, again, installing from a CD-ROM. I know that some Mac PCs don't exactly have a CD-ROM with them. You can purchase an external um, CD drive, external drive, where you can do that for, for your Mac. Some do come with them, some do not. Make sure that you have that. They're usually not very expensive, around $25 if you need to purchase one. Plug it into the port and you should be good to go. Same thing there. Um, again, same thing goes for you from uh, installing from the web. I encourage you to do it, but also be cautious when doing it too. Um, Microsoft Office, Adobe Photoshop can be purchased and downloaded now. Um, there's a lot of ways, Google Chrome web browser and those sort of things, there's usually a safer way to do that. They'll catch more things that way than um, anything else if they, someone tries to, to do that. Um, step one, locate the download, like it says here, like they're showing Firefox here. Um, select the file. Okay, you see Firefox there, the cursor's on that one, that's what he wants, so you're going to, uh, going to click that one. Then a dialog box will appear here with the application folder. Click and drag the icon into the application folder. Click it and move it over there. The application is now installed. You can double click the icon at the top of the program. Once you double click it, um, it should, a box should show up for you to open, so click open. Once you're done, you can eject the installation disk. Do this simply to drag the, cash, the, the trash can on the dock, okay? Um, pretty simple. And just a side note, some applications will use the package extension um, instead of DMG. In this case, you can simply uh, follow the instructions to install the software. It'll walk, it, walk you through it. Um, again, tips for finding software, same thing there. Um, make sure that it is for a Mac if you're gonna search for things. Um, software, make sure you put that it is for a Mac and not, not a Windows operating system. Again, the Mac App Store. Um, lots of great things, just like the App Store on your iPhone or your iPad. You can get most of the things here. Movies, music, um, tools, helpful applications, games. It's all there for you. So um, enjoy. Enjoy searching for things that, that you want to do. As you can see, pictures of what they may look like. Um, some are free. Some you may have to pay for again, but um, just, just be conscious. You can download things, and this is a safe way to do that. They have been checked out by the App Store most, most usually, and that makes it easy for you. All right, we have made it through installing. Now let's talk about the hard thing, getting rid of stuff that you did install. Um, this is something that maybe you need to do because you don't like the program. Maybe it's a reason you need to do it to clear space. Or maybe it's a reason that there was a virus kind of attached to it and you need to get rid of this thing. So there's, there's many reasons to why we do this. Um, like I said, you may find that those are the reasons, but you need to uninstall the software. So let's talk about Windows folks first and we'll finish on the Mac folks. Um, open the control panel again. Go click on the Microsoft uh, icon. Come over here. Click on your control panel. Okay. Select uninstall a program in the programs category. You see it's selected for us here. 
um, under programs make sure you click uninstall a program this and you can select the desired application um, here they're going to get rid of the ask toolbar they don't need that they don't want it it's overtaking things that they do want so let's get rid of it it's going to ask you it's going to ask you to confirm that you want to uninstall this so assure you want to uninstall taskbar yes um, and even has a box here in the future do not show me this dialog box if you hit that you want it, it if, if you don't want to see that every time get rid of it but um, go my opinion go ahead and leave it because you may get it you may have a change of heart or um, may realize that you didn't mean to uh, click that particular one um, after that that's it for Windows that's it the program is removed from your computer it's no more it's gone you don't have to worry about it any longer so that's it that's all it is to uninstall for that last thing our Mac guys Windows folks you are done this is the last thing for our Macs folk our Mac folks same thing goes here you need to get rid of this thing um, open um, finder window and then select applications as you can see here go to your finder and select applications you can see what your screen should look like right here okay locate the desired application as you can see here it kinda looks like they're gonna look at uh, Microsoft PowerPoint click on it and then once it's in the trash can empty the trash can very simple even simpler than Windows so very easy that's it the application is removed it's no longer um, you can always go back and re-add applications if it was a mistake you can go back and uh, add it if you find that you find yourself in a situation where you do need it but that is it um, that is the end of our session tonight I do want to show you a few things before we go I talked to you about a uh, about a website here called TechSoup. Here it is. Um, you can buy computers from them. Um, this is for 501c3s only. This is for 501c3. So you can purchase Norton. You can uh, talk about different. They have different tech topics. Um, Tim Steps for planning a successful webinar. They have everything. Office. And the way this the way this program works is that they receive donations from um, from these companies from Microsoft they receive them from Adobe they receive them from you know um, McAfee all the different type of programs they, they they receive this stuff as you can see they have QuickBooks and a lot of um, accounting software everything that you need to be uh, successful technology wise for a nonprofit um, I encourage you to visit that website yes it does cost a little bit of money but not nearly as much as it would in the store so if there's some programming and stuff and you're not really getting what you need out of free stuff that you're finding online I encourage you as a 501c3 to visit this website they can try to help you out a little bit and I'll continue to talk to you guys about different websites that that can help you the other one is the one that we've been using all night I will be covering these this this year but I will show you just the basic layout of gcflearnfree.org you can do anything from Microsoft 2016 you can even share your story um, different technologies Microsoft Office um, if you have a student that wants to learn reading or to do math better you can jump on here and do those type of things too um, they teach you about mobile apps and then if you're not sure what you want to do they have work and career things um, everyday life type things such as using Google Maps and those sort of applications but if you're not sure you can move to all topics and boom there you are here's your stuff for computers here's your stuff for email internet programs such as Chrome Edge Firefox uh, Internet Explorer um, you can stuff uh, Mac programs all the different things basics here uh, 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 Capitan Yo Yosemite Mavericks Mountain Lion Lion it's all here for for everything um, different devices digital skills photos and graphics um, all your different social medias you know your Facebook's your 
Facebook for iPhone, which is a totally different subject. And then the thing that most people are scared of these days is using the cloud, um, all your Google accounts, uh, Microsoft accounts, OneDrive, and those sort of things. Um, this is the tool that we'll be teaching from this year. Um, hopefully more of you can join us next time. I know Computer Basics is something that a lot of folks don't feel like they need anymore, but it's always good to have a good refresher. When want to start the folks off who may not know these things off on the right foot. That way they can keep, keep up with the rest of the class. So again, I want to thank you all for uh, joining in with us. If you weren't able to watch us uh, live tonight, I encourage you to go back and watch this. Again, this is worth TA hours for our um, possible CAUTA grant recipients and our community work recipients. Remember, you have to do 150 hours of that for, for the year if you plan on uh, writing and possibly being funded for, for our programming. Um, and we're here for you. We're here to answer your questions. It's C-H-R-I-S dash Welch, W-E-L-C-H, at Cherokee.org. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, come see us on October 25th. Learn about what it's like to work in, to, in a Cherokee community and how to create that change together with the community. And then come visit me again for two days of, of food, learning, and, uh, and fun games whenever we uh, talk about what it takes to manage a nonprofit. I'm very excited about this uh, program. These are all things that, that over my eight years here at the Cherokee Nation have found very helpful and being able to help teach you how you can be better at what you're doing and help us match our mission with our goals and with our programs and services. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, wish you a good night. Thank you.